Namaste. Namaste. Welcome back to Grow with the Jan family. Mena nama Anjali hai. And today we're going to watch uh, the Tibetan Prime Minister, Dr. Lobog Sang Sanjay, uh, speak at the law school as part of a two day visit. Um, and his audience was primarily Chinese students asking him yeah. pretty frank questions. Um, so. We're going to watch this to see his response to them, but we know Tibet is fighting for its freedom. We know, hopefully, um, the U.S. will sign... The bill passes. The bill. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, hopefully, we pray that the president signs that bill that passes through so that at least the U.S. recognizes Tibet as a free country so that hopefully other countries will follow suit. Um, they are such... A peaceful country yeah they believe in democracy they follow suit you know like India like peaceful um, you know Buddhist democracy like freedom of speech the the simple things that they're looking for is what everybody what we all take for granted really um, and that everybody should have as an opportunity and we sent letters to the president, to the, some of the governors, um, congresswomen, saying how much, and like we said, we hope and pray that the bill goes through here and we will do all we can um, possible to support the Tibetans for their freedom because they need it. The Dalai, the Holy Dalai Lama needs to go back to Tibet for, before too much longer. Yeah. Um, he's already spent over 60 years in India. But I know everybody loves um, and respects him and all the Tibetans that have written on our channel and, and the Indians that have responded to them. It is the most peaceful. I've never seen any rude or mean comments. I've seen all like, you guys are always welcome here and thank you so much. And mm -hmm. um, we're like brothers. Um, so it would be wonderful to have Tibet have their freedom back for the Holy Dalai Lama to go back and then for India to have at least one peaceful neighbor yeah. on their border. So um, let's start this up because this is a little bit long. So um, first I'm from China and I know that in the China, Chinese official mass media would just um, regard that organization as, as a kind of suffrage. But uh, okay, I'm just curious um, that it is reported that you've never been to Tibet. So, um, how can you just, from what sources do you get the, uh, the information from Tibet and, and how can you ensure that you are on behalf of the, of the Tibetan people? And thank you. Well, I get that question all the time. Uh, number one, I have not been to Tibet because the Chinese government did not allow me to go to Tibet. Um, I went to Beijing, I went to Shanghai, I went to Wutaishan. So when I was in Beijing, I requested Chinese officials that I be allowed to go to Lhasa because you always say that, you know, any Tibetan can come and see for themselves how good Tibet is, and how happy Tibetans are. And I said, I want to go and see myself. And they said, they don't have enough people to receive me in Lhasa. And I said, you have 1.2 billion Han Chinese. Uh, in, in fact, I made a personal request because the previous year my late, uh, my late father had passed away. And I said, as a Tibetan, it's very important that a son uh, goes to a holy uh, temple and light a butter lamp in, in memory of your late father. And I said, I'll just fly in the morning and come back uh, in the evening. You know, uh, it was personal for me. And still, the Chinese official gave me the same response. We don't have enough people to receive you in Lhasa. So can you imagine what I was thinking? Obviously, when I first made the request, uh, it was a request. Obviously, any Tibetan would like to go to Tibet, whether the Chinese government says or not. 
you come where you're welcome to come see uh, the situation yourself. But when I made the uh, second request, it was personal, you know. When you get the same response, you feel like, you know, I'm dealing with this kind of people. No consideration whatsoever for very personal, emotional, uh, and family reasons. Uh, so that's why. Now, how uh, do I know about uh, Tibet? Uh, there are plenty of sources. In fact, I, uh, you know, I, you, you might have read that uh, I spent the last 16 years at Harvard Law School, and I met hundreds and hundreds of uh, Chinese students and scholars, and I've organized meetings between Chinese and Tibetans. I've invited some of the top Chin Chinese scholars from Beda, uh, Minzu Tashi, uh, Tsinghua, and all that. Uh, so, uh, I have had many rounds of discussions with Chinese, and I often tell them they come out believing um, that, you know, uh, they're convinced that the uh, situation in Tibet is very good, uh, and they give you all kinds of reasons. Oh, you can have more than one children, uh, uh, there are more buildings, water, electricity, all that. And I said, uh, uh, what is the source of your information uh, about Tibetans? And they say, oh, uh, Xinhua, People's Daily, CCTV. And I said, normally, how much do, do you trust this Chinese media when it comes to your life? When it comes to China and Chinese people, they say, oh, 50-50. 50 is true, 50 is not true. Then I, I, then I asked them, which portion of 50% on Tibet you think is not true? Because you talk to me as though whatever you read about Tibet in Chinese media is true. But when it comes to your life, 50% is not true. So I said, first of all, let's begin with which portion of 50% is not true. Now, uh, how do I know about Tibet? Uh, many ways. First, I've met many, many, many Tibetans who have fled from Tibet, who are settled in India. In fact, I just met some Tibetans who have arrived uh, from Tibet just recently, uh, and who are students, uh, who worked for Tungdambu, who worked for uh, uh, PSB, Public Security Bureau, uh, who worked uh, as teachers, all kinds. Um, so, so these are, these, these are the sources through which I get uh, information as far as Tibet is concerned. You mentioned that you met a lot of Tibetan people, but the fact is, you have to, we have to admit that the Tibet as a region in China is still pretty uh, comparatively impoverished, and uh, not many Tibetan, I mean, not many inborn uh, Tibetan students born in Tibet have opportunities to study abroad or just walk abroad. So probably uh, are most of the Tibetan people you meet, you met, you already met, are that not born in Tibet, or just probably like you. And so, and also, uh, and things you said, lots of Chinese official mass medias, uh, medias they are pr pretty biased and prejudiced. But what about the media here? How do you think? How can you just, just? Um, Use a double standard to judge the media. Thank you. I, I, I think uh, it seems I didn't make it, made it clear. When I said I met uh, Tibetans recently, I meant Tibetans from Tibet. I just met some in Virginia who are from Tibet, who just came a few months to study here. And then other Tibetans who fled Tibet and have come to India. Monks, students, because we have a Tibetan reception center in Dharamsala. And a uh, few hundred Tibetans come, come there every year. Uh, in fact, before 2008, anywhere from two to 5,000 Tibetans come there. So we get first-hand information uh, about Tibet from Tibetans who have fled Tibet. And those who have worked as teachers, as students, as I said, in Tungdambu and all. So these are the sources. And there are many other sources as well. Now, Akin, I think in your first question, you added something, which I forgot to answer, which you said, so how can I represent Tibetans from Tibet? 
And that raises the question, how can Chinese government represent the Tibetans in Tibet? Or the party secretary of Tibet Autonomous Region represent Tibetans in Tibet? They were not voted by Tibetans? Uh, that's a very good question. Now, if you take that logic, if you build highways, if you build houses, then Tibet, uh, Tibetans should remain uh, part of China. Then I think uh, British built Hong Kong. It was a fishing village when British took over. But in 1997, Chinese government said we should transfer it back to us. British could have made the argument, no, look at this, it was just a, you know, a slow fishing village. We have transformed it into the most expensive real estate in the world. But Chinese government said nothing doing. Whatever you have built is not important. Whether Hong Kong people's life is improved or not is not important. You have to transfer it back to us. Why? Because it belongs to us, isn't it? Here is a question for you. Um, I'm from China, and my only concern for Tibet is the human rights. So away from all the things you talk about, about the Chinese media or the Chinese government's things, um, if Tibet as an independent country or independent state, how do you ensure or how do you, uh, what will you do to improve the living standard and the human rights of the local citizen? Um, like any um, country or a region or government, you know, the role of leadership or the government is to improve the livelihood of the people. Now, how would a Tibetan leader would do uh, uh, treat Tibetan people as far as human rights are concerned? I think answer lies, maybe I can borrow Bhutan. Bhutan, they're doing pretty well as far as their human rights and livelihood is concerned. And uh, out of Mongolia, they're doing pretty well on their own. Uh, so, if uh, we have to govern Tibet ourselves, we will do relatively fine because we have done it before for hundreds of years. We can do it. One last question. Um, I yeah. see her. Yeah. We have standing. one last question. Thank you. Um, I'm Chinese, but uh, first of all, before my question, I'd really like to take the opportunity to thank you for coming here and engaging us in this conversation in a very open, transparent style. And I'd like to mention that just a week ago, last Sunday, the Minister of, um, of Public Health in China uh, visited the university. And uh, I actually I asked the student organizer if I could attend the meeting, and the answer was no, because I was not invited. But then now I tell myself that's okay, I can meet the Prime Minister today. <laughs> so, um, so I think Compared to a Chinese counterpart, you actually put yourself on a higher moral ground. Yeah. Thank you. And, um, and for my question, um, I'm just wondering if the United States government uh, plays any kind of role in, the, in terms of fostering this dialogue between China and also the Tibet Excel government and also um, with the incoming presidential election in the States, uh, do you perceive any um, possible policy change if there is a change in the White House? Thank you. Yes, there are uh, several ifs, if there is a change in the White House or not. That we will know on November 6th, actually. Um, I think um, as far as uh, U.S. government's China policy is concerned, is you have to go by what you read in the paper and from the speeches made by both uh, President Barack Obama and Governor uh, Mitt Romney. 
Um, normally, the U.S. government did not have major changes uh, uh, as far as uh, China is concerned. But uh, President Obama declared uh, uh, U.S. foreign policy to pivot uh, towards Asia, uh, perhaps with China uh, as, uh, if not the, one of the main uh, component of, you know, uh, uh, its uh, foreign policy in Asia. So in that sense, there might be more emphasis, more focus uh, on Asia. Uh, and already, I think, they have begun to do so, uh, and on China as well. So in that sense, that, that there might be that shift. Um, now, U.S. government always urges uh, Tibetans and Chinese uh, to solve the issue through dialogue. Uh, there's, there was a human rights dialogue um, in August between, uh, you know, strategic dialogue uh, between uh, uh, Chinese and uh, uh, American counterpart, and one component uh, was Tibet. And, uh, but from what I heard was uh, the Chinese, head of the Chinese delegation was quite vocal uh, and quite animated when it came to whole day uh, the Chinese delegation was fine discussing about all other issues when it came to Tibet uh, and mentioning his solemnness dial now name and my name was also mentioned I believe oh they were very very animated um, so hopefully uh, that kind of emotion and animation will be less <laughs> with Xi Jinping at helm uh, and then you know we will look at the issue uh, more uh, rationally and solve the issue. From our side, uh, you know, this has been a long-standing uh, goal from our side to solve the issue of Tibet peacefully through dialogue. Now, in that sense, perhaps because you said it, I'll also share it here. Uh, we make ourselves available when His Holiness Dalai Lama comes to Minnesota or wherever he goes. We make it a point to meet with Chinese students and scholars, uh, whether we get uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, questions, emotional questions or questions based on ignorance or informed or not, we welcome because, you know, we have to have dialogue. Ultimately, Chinese and Tibetan people, we have to solve this issue. Uh, because you mentioned human rights, let me give you one fact, actually, uh, that you can check. Um, in Lhasa, 70% of businesses, private entrepreneurship, hotels, restaurants, even taxis, are owned or run by Chinese. 50% of, of Communist Party members in Tibet Autonomous Region, the local Communist Party, more than 50% are Chinese. Now on the one hand, the Chinese government says, in Tibet Autonomous Region, 92% of the population is Tibetan. Only 8% are Chinese or non-Tibetans. Now, if 8% of population controls 50% of the Communist Party apparatus, from postmen to cook to the top leadership, how would Tibetan feel? Of the 13 top uh, Communist Party leaders in uh, Lhasa, seven, if I'm not wrong, are Chinese. Of the remaining six, one is half Chinese, other is married to Chinese, or other brother-in-law is Chinese, things like that, you see. And the top judges are Chinese, top policemen are Chinese, military personnel are Chinese. Even the local People's Congress, majority are Tibetan, but the standing committee of the local People's Congress, majority are Chinese. So how would Tibetan feel sitting there in Lhasa, thinking when Chinese army first moved in, they say we are going to build uh, all these things for you. Uh, our presence here is to benefit you Tibetan people. You will be master of your own area. Then after 50, now 60 years, what you see around, there are a lot of buildings, yes, the railway, yes, but more Chinese uh, come to uh, Tibet through the railway. More natural resources uh, is taken out of Tibet through this railway line. And then, in fact, you can Google, there's a picture 
of a Chinese shop advertising job, job vacancy, which says that if you are Chinese, you will get 50 RMB a day. And if you are Tibetan, you will get 30 RMB a day. In Lhasa, the capital city of Tibet, how would you feel if there is a signpost in Beijing saying, if you are American, we give you $50 a day. If you are Chinese, you get $30 a day. How would you feel? So these are facts. And then 40% of high school and college graduates, Tibetans, are unemployed. They protested before the employment agency in Lhasa because they are unemployed. So even if you work hard, even if you get a college degree, even if you get high school degree, if you, didn't, if you don't get jobs, how would you feel? So these are facts. And then that's why I said the hardline policy has failed. And it will continue to fail. That's why Tibetans are now resentful. And not only resentful, they are protesting in a very drastic form through self emulations Now, why or who would choose to die than leave normally? Nobody would like once, you know, uh, would uh, choose to die. Even if someone pinches you, you say, you say, ouch, and in fact, maybe slap back. <laughs> you know? But Tibetans are not harming Chinese or Chinese army personnel or even Chinese shopkeeper or Chinese taxi driver, but are harming oneself and burning oneself as a sign of protest. So this is the situation. But as a human being, to conclude this remark actually, I want to end on hopeful note that uh, there will be more moderation on the part of the Chinese government and realization that the present policy is not working and then decide to resolve the issue of Tibet peacefully through dialogue. I tried at Harvard organized seven major conferences inviting Chinese scholars. Uh, in fact, two meetings in 2003 and 2009 were between Chinese students and scholars and His Holiness Dalai Lama very early on. Uh, we have not solved the issue but we have had many rounds of dialogue and through dialogue, a better understanding of the situation and, uh, 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 and hopefully a better, a uh, little better foundation to resolve the issue of Tibet. We will continue to have differences, but through differences uh, we learn uh, about each other and then uh, one day soon solve the issue of Tibet and then hopefully we will meet in Lhasa. Thank you. He definitely speaks to the Tibetan people, like, yeah. um, you know, how he wants peaceful dialogue between the Chinese Communist Party, and they're not giving it to him. They're not letting him not go to Tibet. They're not letting him, you know, the, they're not really engaging in any dialogue. Um, and like he said, when they do meet with other people and start talking about Tibet, it's like a heated discussion. Um, they just tell the world Tibet's fine, yes, but they don't let apparently. anyone in. Yeah, their their newspapers are saying, you know, Tibetan people are happy. Just go to Tibet and see, but they're not letting anybody go and actually see. And I thought it was interesting that they brought up like um, human rights. But I would um, think that would be more CCP. of a, a CCP issue as opposed to if the Tibetan, if the Holy Dalai Lama could go back to his home country and he could go back. Or and, like social be, media for the actual people. Yeah, could go back and, and be the leaders that they should be in Tibet um, would be such a different country. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech. Like he said, the people that are supposed to be representing Tibet were not elected by the Tibetan people, were put into place by the CCP. Another thing was, the other thing they talked about was the railroads and the things they brought to Tibet. Mm. And then he counterbacked that with yeah. Hong Kong. And yeah. I was like, yes, because that is what happened. Mm -hmm. Like, you take it back because it's yours now, apparently. It's yours now because yeah. they made it all better and all nice and Beautiful. pretty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a big part of China could be a big part of China. But China can take Tibet, make it big, and say, oh, this is mine now because I made it big. Right. 
So the Tibetan people can't get it back. Though when China first came in, like you said, they were under the impression um, that they were there to help make stuff better. Make yeah. more roads, make more jobs, make more buildings, electricity, water, all this stuff. And and we know that they, they forced the Holy Dalai Lama to sign these agreements. Yeah. But they, we know, we've learned from many things lately, doing stuff on China, the CCP doesn't keep their word. No. At all. Not at all. And you can see it, even though, you know, even the Chinese students that were questioning him, they didn't get the chance to speak with the people from China that came to visit the school. Yeah. Why? Because... Because they don't want you to ask questions because then you're going to know the truth. Well, what is the truth? Yeah. The the news in China, like you said, 50-50 chance it might say something that's right. Only because your life's on it. Right. But when they talk about the Tibetans, oh, everything is right. Their life is wonderful. How is their life wonderful? But what the news talks about your life, well, sometimes it's right. Yeah, sometimes it's wrong. Uh, we know the what news is, is not difference? perfect. You know, it is always somebody else's perspective. But the fact that half of what that comes out in the news is wrong about what's going what on in your country. What part of that is wrong? <laughs> How is it 100% of what they talk about Tibet is right? I, that's, yeah. So this was an old video. This was 2012. Now yeah. it's 2020. And like we said, hopefully President Trump will sign this Tibet bill to yeah. recognize it as a free country. And hopefully that will kind of trickle down and other countries will also recognize Tibet. And then maybe China will be willing to open up discussion, not a heated one. They are such peaceful people. The fact that the Chinese Communist Party thinks that the Holy Dalai Lama is a terrorist is beyond, beyond my belief. He is the nicest, sweetest person. I mean, we've only seen a few video clips of him, but I could not imagine him ever being considered a mm. terrorist. That would be the last word out of my mouth about the Holy Dalai Lama. He is the epitome of peace. Um, yeah. So we hope and pray, and we will keep sending our letters um, in hopes that this passes through. The bill passes. Mm -hmm. And that Tibet gets its freedom. That is yeah. the ultimate goal because they deserve it to be a free country. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. And don't forget to subscribe. And join our wonderful Growing Jan family. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.